This is TransCast from the Metrans Transportation Center. I'm Matt Kaplan. Each year, leaders in the movement of goods to and across the United States join transportation researchers and international experts for the National Urban Freight Conference. They attend scores of sessions and share the latest data about the many challenges faced by this essential component of the American economy. Michael Onder flew in from Washington to participate. Mike is the team leader for freight operations and technology in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Freight Management and Operations. He molds partnerships between the freight industry and government to foster collaboration on issues like the congestion that plagues so many cities. Prior to his service in D.C., Mike worked in both the legislative and executive sectors for the state of Florida. I sat down with Mike right after his presentation that opened the 2009 NUF conference. Mike, thanks very much for, uh, first of all, joining us here on TransCast, but also making the trip out to be part of the National Urban Freight Conference this year. My pleasure, Matt. Thank you. I have the benefit of having just heard some of your opening remarks upstairs, Mm -hmm. and uh, I find them very encouraging and uh, also sobering because of the (laughs) challenge that we face. And I'm going to start by asking you, I mean, you mentioned that there are maybe 26,000 miles, which is a pretty staggering figure, of major corridors, those upon which freight most depends in this country? Yes. One of the things that we've done, Matt, is look at the volumes of traffic, both uh, on trucks as well as rail and as far as uh, water is concerned. And we've looked at how those move throughout the country from origin to destination. And we've tried to plot from that uh, what may be the major corridors that we ought to be giving uh, heavy emphasis to especially as it relates to uh, the log jams that occur at transfer points and uh, all of the other kinds of bottlenecks that uh, we run into from not only a freight perspective, but the freight can also block the uh, passenger traffic as well. So we're looking at how do we keep freight more or less on its own corridors and try to keep it moving through the system. Not only... Um, looking at how the uh, heavy or the hard infrastructure actually supports that, but also looking at how backroom systems work together in order to share information between various uh, parties that are conducting the freight movement. So it covers a lot of territory. I'll say. Mm -hmm. You had that great slide that showed lots of green in, Mm. as expected, the rural parts of the country, Mm -hmm. but those red nodes that it was no coincidence they corresponded to the urban areas. They did, yes, because that's where all the transfer is taking place. And, of course, once you hit the urban area, you know, you've got less space on the highways to actually move those goods. We're also looking at a project, and we're using Kansas City as a laboratory for this, for how we can actually move freight quicker through the community and using uh, navigation technologies for that, working with traffic management centers to find out where the incidents might be to reroute trucking especially away from those incidents so they don't exacerbate what's already there. And uh, so that's something we're working on right now and working, like I say, with Kansas City Smartport, with a metropolitan planning organization there called MARC, Mid-America Regional Council, and uh, the community, Kansas City Community, Kansas City Scott, which is the traffic, they run the traffic management centers in the community. So it's a collaborative effort with uh, not only the industry, but also other government partners. FHWA is obviously giving special attention to the challenges that these urban areas present. We, we absolutely are. And initially, when this project got started, got underway, we were looking at how do we improve the efficiency of freight flow, especially at transfer points. You know, Kansas City is sort of a miniature Chicago in the sense that you've got steel wheels coming in from rail on the West Coast, steel mm-hmm. wheels from the East Coast. And the transfer of goods between those two steel wheel units generally has to take place by through rubber tires interchanges. <laughs> so you got the trucks moving through the community in order to do that. There is some steel wheel interchange, and I think the railroads are getting better at that. But for the most part, you still have that congestion associated with moving the goods from one side of town to the other. And in this particular instance, we thought, you know, maybe the best way to do that would be to, to link 
the rail, because normally Union Pacific and Norfolk Southern compete with each other. They don't collaborate, you know, together on how they can best jointly make their operations more efficient. So we kind of became the colla- the uh, facilitator at the table to bring them together, mm. along with two other railroads, Kansas City Southern, uh, as well as uh, uh, BNSF, Burlington Northern Santa Fe. So all four railroads in that community are cooperating on this, and they're sharing information. They're doing it through non-disclosure agreements for the most part, but they are sh- going to share information so that you can make sure that if a truck picks up a load in one yard, they don't have to, when they take it to the, to the uh, yard across town, they don't have to wait to find out whether there's a load to bring back or not, or they may come back empty-handed, and that's one of the things we don't want. We don't want empty moves on the highway, nor, nor does the industry. The industry wants as many revenue moves as possible. So I think we're working together in the same vein with that. The feature that we've kind of added on is what we call real-time traffic management, and that's when you do pick up your order for whatever you're going to, what yard you're going to pick it up or what yard you're going to take it to, you also have traffic management information that's been provided to you before you actually make that move. So that gives us an opportunity not only to reduce unnecessary traffic, those trucks that would be carrying empty loads, but also to route them the most efficient manner through the town and keep them away from other commuters as best as possible. This seems like a very good example of something you said upstairs, that the efficient movement of freight through urban areas Mm -hmm not necessarily uh, incompatible with a livable community, a community where there is, for one thing, less congestion. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that uh, is guiding us through a lot of this as well, is how do we make that community more attractive to the businesses that are coming into it? Because for econ- economic development perspectives, uh, for the community itself, they want to attract more industry, but at the same time, they can't attract industry if industry sees I can't do much, <laughs> do very well in moving my goods to this community unless you uh, help me do that a little bit better. So they're putting that in place to help on uh, not only with the existing industry that's in the community, but also with industry that they're trying to attract to the community. Clearly, the goods have got to get there. Another point that you made yes. 200 million Americans in those red blotches on the map. Those major the, ma- major urban centers, the mega er- mega areas that we're calling it now, mega mega urban areas, yeah, there's 200 million people that uh, populate those centers. And a, a regular theme that we talk about is the relatively low profile that the role of freight and the importance of freight movement in this country really plays in people's lives or in their everyday consciousness. It's everyday. They're, they're the demanders. They're the ones that are bringing the freight to their front door. They're sitting on the computer and ordering things through the Internet. Uh, I think last year over 7% of all retail uh, was done through the Internet. Hmm. So wow. that's a pretty staggering number when you think about it. Sure is. And it's all probably only going to get bigger. But every time you sit there and punch something into that computer and tell them this is what I want to buy, you're expecting it to appear at your front door three days later. So that's that's the expectations that are already set up. Well, that van that's bringing that to your door has got to go through the community <laughs> to get there. And, and the more vans that there are out there, the more congestion we're going to see just from those kinds of deliveries alone. Let's say something about what's known in the industry as the last mile. Yes. And the importance of that in reducing a term that was new to me until recently, VMT, vehicle miles traveled. Yes. Uh, because those trucks don't just stay up there on those interstates that you're, you guys are responsible for. They've got to get off. They've got to get in and out of the ports and so on. Yes, exactly. And I think that's uh, the one map that uh, I was showing earlier in the presentation. Part of the red that you're seeing in the urban community is the traffic that's slowing down. I mean, the the green is, tra- is traffic that's moving at highway speeds. The red is reduced below highway speeds. doesn't mean it's completely stopped, but certainly it has been reduced because of the amount of congestion there is in the community. But for the most part, these goods have got to um, be transferred to uh, other conveyances or other vehicles. So you have a large truck uh, 18-wheeler that's coming into the community, 
and it's going to be that load is going to be devanned at some kind of a warehouse facility or distribution center. It'll either go into that distribution center and sit there for a while, or it will be cross docked to another truck that might be a delivery van going to deliver some of these internet supplies that we're talking about. People ordering, you know, over over their computers. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's that kind of situation. And the last mile is akin to what I would call a cross-country trip on an airplane. If we're flying from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, it takes about five hours to get to uh, to Los Angeles from Washington, D.C. It could possibly take, uh, once you get to Los Angeles and get into a taxi cab, it could possibly take another hour or two to get to your end destination, <laughs> I've been which there. could be 20 to 40 percent of your total trip mm-hmm. is taken place in, in that taxi cab where you've covered maybe 20 miles versus the 3,000 miles that you covered in the airplane. So I, I liken it to that. You're out on the open highway with a truck, you get into the urban area, and you've got to make your deliveries in that urban area, and all of a sudden you are jammed up in traffic, and you can't make any particular schedule. You have to just abide by whatever the congestion issues are uh, ahead of you. Yeah. So one of the things we're looking at is how do you facilitate the movement of that that traffic through the community. I think New York is doing some work in that area as well. I'm sure Los Angeles is, is as well. But I, a little commercial message, the one that I mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation this morning is uh, November 18th, we're meeting in mm-hmm. Anaheim with the industry as well as other governmental entities to talk more about this particular uh, crosstown improvement activity that we're talking about and uh, how that might fit into the uh, Southern California region. And this is the Intermodal Freight Technology Working Group? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And it's very focused regionally, I think you said. We're going to try to focus. It was focused nationally. We're primarily looking at the industry, with the industry, working with the industry, saying what problems are you encountering that you feel might be addressed through technology? This project we're doing in Kansas City is a result of that collaboration with industry. They are the ones that wanted this project. We picked Kansas City because... Uh, it was a mini Chicago in a sense, you know, it was a laboratory. We wouldn't mm. have to go to where uh, we we would have very difficult time keeping people's attention in a community like Chicago, whereas Kansas City, it's just a little bit better, more workable. And even with the economic downturn, it's even been uh, a lot easier. And this, like, I think somebody mentioned, you know, you, you should make hay. You're suffering from some economic downturn right now, but at the same time, why not go ahead and look at fix it what you can so when everything starts to pop back into place you're a little bit more ready for it than you might otherwise be this is That's sort of the lull before the storm yes, turns exactly <laughs> it's, it's going to come back yeah um, we're going to break off in a moment here because we're going to go back up to one of the many many breakout sessions underway i think I, they said over a hundred papers being presented That's at what the i session. understand yes uh-huh. Lots of researchers here with lots of fascinating, exciting, innovative ideas. How does the FHWA see the role of researchers, particularly university researchers, in, in solving some of these problems you've talked about? One of the ways, I mean, there is this uh, University Transportation Center group uh, that looks at a variety of transportation topics. Uh, we're Naturally, uh, from the freight perspective, we try to encourage them to look as much as possible at freight. But one of the things that we did a number of years ago when when some of this got started is we asked for the plans of all of the university transportation centers so that we knew which ones had the particular skill sets, you know, and also the interest in grappling with freight problems that we could work with uh, because we put together a performance plan every year in conjunction with all of the uh, the administrator and all the leadership within not only Federal Highway but in USDOT. And our performance plan is focused in particular areas. We want to make sure that we're aligned closely with where reality really is, you know, with the states and communities and with industry. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we're working with the Unif- University Transportation Centers to help them better focus because they're looking for guidance in this particular area. So, yes, we... We've been working very closely with them. And then there's also another program through the Transportation Research Board 
that's very important here. It's, it's called the NCFRP, the National Cooperative Freight Research Program under TRB. I'm going to go out on, I'm going to take a guess. I, I can't remember the exact amount. I think it was like $25 million mm. that's allocated to that program. And they, in turn, then accept applications. So you can have a research problem that you're trying to address, and you can make application to the Transportation Research Board. And many people have uh, realized success through that program as well. So we're encouraging uh, research from a variety of different sectors. We also are looking at for innovative financing of uh, some of the research projects as well uh, through use of uh, CMAC money, which is primarily uh, congestion mitigation air quality funds that are made available by Congress. So we see that playing a stronger role, especially from an environmental perspective, if we are coming to grips with some of the unnecessary traffic out there, then we're reducing emissions, and mm. that's certainly getting a handle on congestion air quality. I, I suppose I'm obligated to provide the commercial reminder that Metrans, as you know, is one of those federal transportation centers. Yes, they are. Centers. Right. And I'm sorry I should have recognized no, that No, no, that's quite all right, because you set upstairs that you were actually around as Metrans was. was created. I was, uh, I was asked to serve on an advisory board when Metran was wor- first created, and I, I worked closely with Randy Hall in that, those early days. Uh, 15 years, roughly, with FHWA. 15 years, yes, sir. Lots of time mm-hmm. in the public sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, you finished by expressing, I, I took it to be anyway, uh, a good deal of optimism about the challenges that, uh, that we face. I, I think it's exciting times that we face here because there's a lot of room for us to use our brain power to try to figure out how we can get ahead of this problem with congestion. When, when you look at what's going on in our country and you say our country is uh, 300 years old, Uh, And you look at Europe uh, being thousands of years old and how they've gotten ahead of some of the congestion that they faced within their larger communities. And I think I also mentioned, you know, that uh, the European countries stack pretty high as far as livability with freight. I I think we have a good opportunity to do some of the same things and maybe even leapfrog ahead of where they might be Mm. uh, by the use of technology and, um, and keeping... Uh, healthy, vibrant communities, economically viable, to a happy community as well. And I think those are good challenges that face us, but I think they're, they're uh, meetable goals. Mike, thanks again for joining us on Transcast. Thank you, Matt. Truly appreciate it. Mike Launder is the Freight Operations and Technology Team Leader for the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration in Washington, of course, visiting us out here on the West Coast this week for the National Urban Freight Conference underway in Long Beach. This has been a Metrans Transcast. Metrans is funded by the United States Department of Transportation and the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans. We hope you'll join us for the next edition of Transcast. Transcast.